So I just want to welcome everyone tonight to our Discover the Naturalist Within. Uh, Edson Victor was kind of a local phenomena here for many years and his exhibit is in the back at the end of tonight's uh, presentation. You're welcome to tour the gallery, look at the displays. Uh, not only do we have Edson Victor, but we have the Renstead Collection. It's a Native American clothing uh, exhibit. Buzz Saw Sharks of Idaho and Shark a Bit. So there's a lot going on out there. You can spend a little time there. Uh, I do want to, bathrooms are downstairs, housekeeping. And then in this room right now, there's an art show. You may have not have noticed, or maybe you have. Uh, this last semester, artists, um, students from the Fine Arts Department came in three times, used the gallery as a um, uh, motivation, inspiration to do some drawings, and then it was a juried show. And so these are the final selections of the people from that class, so you can take a little time afterwards maybe to, to look at some of the artwork. Very talented. Uh, upcoming events, I handed you a little card. The only thing that's not on that card is an upcoming lecture series in January. January 30th, uh, Anne Merkley will be talking about her research on the Renstead glass plates, uh, Native American clothing. So um, that will be fun. Um, membership, um, certainly if you like what you're seeing happening at the museum right now, we'd love to have you join, become a member. Uh, certainly sign up for our newsletter if not and stay in touch. Become an insider here at the museum and and join us in some of the fun things we're doing. A couple of thank yous. I want to thank Chuck Peterson. Chuck helped with the Edson Victor exhibit from the beginning and then also kind of kept me motivated to do a lecture series. It was too early in May, summer was busy, so then we ended up with a fall lecture series. So thank you, Chuck. And he was also one of our speakers. Scott Ergen is here. He was our last speaker at the lecture series. And that was a wonderful one on the antelope. And then tonight, oh, I want to thank Teresa Henderson too. Teresa makes all this happen. Uh, set up cameras, mics, every, refreshments. Uh, so thank you, Teresa. And we do have one other staff person here, Brandon. Brandon is new. And say your last name. Peacock. Peacock, yes, Peacock. So Brandon's here and he's going to be our paleo collection manager. Curator. Curate. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have Brandon here. If you have any questions, welcome. Introduction, Beth. I've had a nice evening with Beth, learning more about her, her background, her butterflies, and it's always fascinating to me, um, scientists and, and their knowledge, their knowledge base. It's amazing what they know. Chuck and her just, you know, back and forth on this Beth species and that species and this uh, piece and that piece. It was, it was interesting. Thank you for sharing. We're happy to be geeks for you. <laughs> So Beth has worked as a wildlife biologist for 30 plus years for the states of Oregon, Washington, and California. She retired from the Idaho Department of Fish and Game in 2018 after leading the Salmon Region's Wildlife Diversity Program for 16 years. <coughs> she led the first statewide survey for monarch butterflies and their milkweed host plants in Idaho. She, um, and worked with the Say it, Xerus Xerces Society, Society. Uh, Washington. Yeah, that's always one of those words that I want to say three different ways. Um, so, and she developed the Western Monarch and um, Milkweed Mappy Mapper online database to gather public source observations. She's going to share a little bit more about that. And recently, she served as editor of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency's Western Monarch Conservation Plan. Um, as an introduction, welcome. Uh, we do have a few specimens up here for later that you can look at also that came out of our butterfly collection and our herbarium collection on milkweed. So there's some of that, but without further ado, Beth, welcome. Oh, well, thanks everybody. Um, it's great to see such a great crowd, and uh, it's especially it's like icing on the cake to see some of my former colleagues with I Hope Fishing Games. So, um, really pleased with the turnout tonight. Thank you for being here. Thanks to Terry and Chuck for inviting me to speak. 
um, about monarch butterflies and how citizen naturalists, citizen scientists, can help out this beautiful and fascinating insect. So uh, we can turn the lights well, down done. right now. Yeah, okay. that, that works. So about um, about 50 odd years ago, I had my first encounter with monarch butterflies. Uh, while well, I was picnicking with my family on the banks of the Mississippi in western Wisconsin. And uh, I just distinctly remember uh, this endless stream of monarchs just flying and floating southward on that early fall day and just, you know, marveling at their beauty and wondering where, where were they heading? Where were all these butterflies heading? Then, um, about 35 years ago, um, I was attending Cal Poly San Luis Obispo on the central coast of California, and uh, I regularly encountered wintering aggregations of monarchs when I was hiking on some of the coastal trails, say out of Pismo Beach or Morro Bay or San Simeon. So fast forward to 2015, news was breaking that the North American monarch populations were in steep decline and we're being petitioned for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Um, <coughs> sounds kind of shocking for uh, a species that was, is perceived as being so abundant in North America. So now working as a wildlife diversity biologist for Idaho Fishing Game in the Salmon region, I began looking into the scientific record of monarchs in Idaho, and I, I was kind of astonished at how little data was uh, just existed for, for the species and its milkweed host plants in the state. So how could we work to conserve monarchs in Idaho if we knew so little about them and if they're milkweed host plants? So this, this is kind of the journey for many wildlife professionals. You have some passion, you have a lot of curiosity, and that leads to study and discovery. This was the journey for biologist, professor, artist, and writer, Edson Victor. And this is also the journey for countless citizen naturalists around the globe. And so that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Oops, I can do it this way. There we go. So before I delve into the monarchs, I just want to acknowledge Edson Victor as a frequent touchstone for me during my 16 years with Idaho Fish and Game in the Salmon region. On the wall above my desk all that time that hung a sign, Victor Prim, featuring some of the iconic wildlife species of Idaho. Victor's Land Beyond Words, the Pesimeroi Valley, was part of my region, and his accounts of that starkly beautiful landscape informed my work there. I had the privilege, really, it was a privilege to survey and monitor pronghorn, sage grouse, long-billed curlew, pygmy rabbit, peregrine falcon, amphibians, brown squirrels, songbirds, and bats in that remarkable area. And his scientific contributions to our knowledge base of these species was invaluable. And his gorgeous illustrations are another <coughs> amazing legacy of this Renaissance man. <laughs> Truly, this guy was like a left brain, right brain dude. <laughs> so let me just say thank you, Dr. Victor. <laughs> Am I getting blocked? <laughs> 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 okay, so let's uh, let's move on to monarchs. Okay, monarchs are a North American icon. They're often um, ingrained in our childhood experiences, like they were in mine, probably many of you too. And they are among the most recognized, study and beloved of North America's insects. Sorry, this got to slow and I can't get it up. <laughs> Their life cycle spans the North American continent, 
from central Mexico up to the southern latitudes of Canada, and that it involves a long distance <coughs> migration that has completed relay style by up to five generations in a single year. And no leaves <coughs> of the genus Asclepius are the monarch's obligate larval host plants, meaning that's the only plant species genus that the um, young larva caterpillars can feed on. Mm -hmm. Milkweeds are the essential links in the chain of habitats that connect monarch breeding populations across North America. <coughs> are you still trying to get it? Yeah, mm -hmm. just have it's a little sticky. There we go. Okay. Um, the North American monarch, though, is facing a pretty uncertain future. Overwintering monarch populations have declined by more than 90% from historic levels in central Mexico. So um, the population in the winter of 2018-2019, uh, one winter ago, was probably the highest that they've had there in the last decade. So that's a little bit of a you know, hopeful thing. <laughs> it's <still scary. laughs> it is, yeah. That's all right. And um, the Western population plummeted to 97% of its historic size in coastal California over wintering areas since monitoring began about 30 years ago. This is a stunning crash from an estimated 4 million on those western overwintering areas in the 1980s to just 30, a little less than 30,000 monarchs in winter of 2018-2019. So the population right now may be hovering near its extinct, extinction threshold, which is very, very concerning. Are you so trying to get it? Yeah, uh, there, there we go. So, <laughs> primarily um, due to these range wide declines um, of petition to list the monarch butterfly as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act, it was submitted to U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in 2014. And the service was scheduled to make a listing decision in June 2019, this year, but they've deferred and uh, delayed on that decision now to December 2020. Uh, the word on that is that they wanted to wait for two additional winters of data before they made their final listing decision, which is fairly risky. <laughs> But uh, loss of milkweed has been, sorry, that went a little fast there. <laughs> sorry, you had technical issues. The loss of milkweed has been identified as the most significant factor that is contributing to the declines of the well-studied eastern monarch population. However, <laughs> in the West, um, really critical data are lacking on some of the limiting factors for this uh, Western population. And the um, plummeting declines of this population are really not fully understood. But there's a lot of research ongoing right now. So uh, available studies right now are suggesting that overwintering habitat loss and loss of central California breeding habitat, as well as pesticide use, are likely the important contributors to the Western monarch's long-term decline. And uh, studies also show that the most vulnerable part of the migratory life cycle for the Western population appears to be concentrated during that overwintering stage and the early spring stage. So we can blame it all on California. <laughs> Answering these pressing questions in the face of alarming declines of North American monarchs it requires an all-hands-on-deck approach. Community scientists, citizen naturalists, citizen scientists, they are a critical component and partner in this effort to save the monarch butterfly. Community science, supported by citizen naturalists, 
is invaluable to contributing to our understanding of the Eastern and Western Marks. It promotes increased awareness of and um, engagement in modern conservation. It also results in really valuable uh, contributions of occurrence data up to important um, monarch research. And it's amplified within communities by those that share that knowledge. So um, that, that's just a huge aspect. And uh, it can also help to move the needle on recovery of the North American monarch population. So many of the community science opportunities around monarchs, they involve observing and reporting observations, occurrences in the field. And to do this with the high accuracy that's really needed for uh, scientific research investigations, it is important to know the basics of monarch identification, life history, and breeding and ecology so you know what to look for while you're in the field. So I'm going to take uh, a detour and we're going to go through some of that, even though you know many of you probably are very familiar with that, but let's, uh, let's just do the review. So the monarch life cycle, um, this, the species scientific name is Danus plexippus plexippus, and I think this uh, butterfly was named, given its scientific nomenclature by someone that was really into, um, I guess I would say the theme of royalty <laughs> and not anything to do with the biology of the creature. So, um, Damas happens to be some failed king from, you know, Greek times and uh, Plexippus was the son of some Greek god that murdered people, you know, I mean, just, uh, it's kind of ridiculous, but it sounds, it, it actually is quite a gorgeous name. <laughs> However, um, the monarch, it, it's one of about 180,000 uh, species in the family Lepidoptera, which includes butterflies, moths, and skippers. Uh, the life cycle of monarchs, as with all Lepidopterans, it consists of four stages, the egg, the larva, or caterpillar, pupa or chrysalis, and then the adult stage. The larvae are herbivores, while the adults consume nectar, and they play a very important role in pollination. So this uh, figure on the left, it's a little bit hard to see the fine print, so don't worry about that, but um, this represents the annual cycle of the monarch. So starting with, let me use my fancy pointer here, starting with the wintering period, um, it, it's kind of, you know, it's kind of a chicken or egg, but let's start with the wintering period here. Uh, the months of December, January, and February, um, the monarchs are in what's called reproductive diapause, and they're just kind of hanging out in mild overwintering spots, either in Mexico or over in coastal California. Uh, they begin dispersing from the wintering areas in that March-April time frame, and that particular generation that overwintered lay the first generation of eggs. And as they're laying the eggs, the population is moving northward, kind of recolonizing North America as they go. And they will have, you know, as many as one, two, three, and in some parts of the country, uh, four, four generations of monarchs produced during that time frame in that relay style uh, migration. Then, come around August right here, um, there are triggers, environmental triggers, that cause the monarch to, um, as I mentioned, kind of go into that reproductive diapause. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. And so that final generation produced in this annual cycle ends up being the migratory generation. That generation is the great, great grandchildren <laughs> of the original adult up here. They have never been to those overwintering sites again, yet somehow they find their way there with all their, you know, kin and kindred. <laughs> and that's just like one of the just unbelievable, kind of miraculous seeming things about these monarchs, that they can home to such, you know, small, relatively small areas 
you know, in North America, find their way there. And then uh, that migration uh, can just occur through, you know, either gradually or fairly quickly, depending on weather, climate conditions, and uh, drought, and you know how how much nectar resources are on the ground, that kind of thing. Until they get uh, by November, most of them are back on the overwintering sites, and then they go into the cycle again. So that, uh, like I said, annual cycle, and then when you go to the uh, the actual life cycle of the creature, uh, you have adults here um, laying laying eggs, um, and those eggs take about three to five days. Uh, before before they hatch into uh, the young larva, larval stage is you know somewhere around two weeks, and the chrysalis stage a little bit longer because they're basically reconstituting their whole body in that time frame. It takes a little longer, uh, so about two weeks there. So the whole process from egg to adult is. Uh, anywhere from 22 to 37 days a uh, month on average. And uh, that time frame, that will vary depending on light, temperature, humidity, uh, that all plays an important role in determining, you know, if it's on the short end or the longer end. Uh, but, but, you know, developing monarchs, they usually prefer temperatures about 70 to 80 degrees humidity in the 60 to 70 percentile range, and normal summer, daylight, night patterns. Um, in Idaho, for instance, we were on the long end of that spectrum right there because we have these cool nights and, it, you know, it just slows down the process of metamorphosis. Okay, so uh, the egg stage here. Um, eggs are laid only on milkweed, as we talked about, and the only plant that mar larva can eat. Um, the eggs are usually laid singly versus in a clump by the female, and usually on the underside of leaves, but sometimes I've seen several on, you know, eggs on flower clusters, things like that. Uh, females can lay anywhere from 300 to 500 eggs in their two to five week lifespan. So they're pretty, uh, I think, fecund is the word. And then they, you know, they measure really small. They're about the size of a, you know, kind of a large pinhead. And they have, if you look at them closely or, you know, with a magnifying lens, they have these um, amazing longitudinal ridges. They're, they're like this architectural wonder when you look at them up close, really, at, at such a small scale. And they're usually kind of a creamy yellow. I've never really seen a white one. They, they always have a yellow tinge to them. And then, uh, as I mentioned, they, they hatch pretty quickly. And as they get closer to hatching stage, you'll see, um, it, you know, kind of the, the shell you know, being very clear, and then you see the black head of the adult, or excuse me, the adult, excuse me, the black head of the larva forming right there. Okay, so the, uh, the larva stage, um, upon hatching, they will turn right around and they will consume their egg case. Then they set to work feeding nearly nonstop on milkweed leaves. They are eating machines, let me tell you, day and night. <laughs> um, the first instar uh, right here, each, each one of these um, stages, uh, this, this, there's a molt between each one of these instars here. So this first instar, you know, it's just the one hatch. Here he is, eating or she, eating their, their little egg case. The next thing they'll do is they will um, kind of graze off the milkweed hairs um, in a very distinct pattern. It's either circular like that or often very crescent shaped. It, it's a really distinctive grazing pattern on milkweed leaves. So if you're if you're out there looking at milkweed and you're always if you're wanting to see if monarchs are there, you're always looking for signs of herbivory that look, you know, from monarchs, and one telltale sign are these little crescents on the, the leaves that show you that there have been either first or second instars there, and they may still be there somewhere on the plant. 
So they, what they do is they, um, they kind of clip these milkweed hairs, which staunches the flow of the milkweed sap so that that little larva doesn't just get mired in that sticky substance. And then they will go ahead and just start chowing down. Um, but milkweed provides monarch larva with a very effective chemical defense against many predators, and you've probably heard about this. Monarch sequester cardenolites, which uh, they're also called cardiac, cardiac gly excuse me, glycosides. Um, these are present in milkweed, um, rendering them poisonous to most vertebrates. They're, uh, the monarch's flashy colors signal warning to primarily bird predators, vertebrate predators, uh, of their toxicity. Um, but these little guys right here, um, you know, they are pretty vulnerable to insect predators. And the insect predators don't seem to be much bothered by the, that kind of toxic element in their tissues. Um, especially, you know, there are fly and wasp parasites, um, you know, that um, make quick work of these, and spiders are, are pretty deadly on some of these little guys. So for every egg that, um, you know, I, if there were a hundred, you know, eggs out there on the landscape, the average survival rate among those hundred eggs is probably ten butterflies. So they're, they really are attacked by the bit, even though we think that, you know, they have these, um, you know, this coloration that is warning, it's, it's primarily for vertebrate predators, uh, birds in particular. So this is just kind of a recap on the larva to give you comparative size between the different instars. So uh, there's the egg right there. There's uh, the first instar, second, third, fourth, and there's the fifth right there. And uh, that fifth one is 3,000 times the mass of um, that little guy right there. So they, they grow incredibly huge <laughs> in such a short period of time. So we went to the pupa stage. Um, when the caterpillar is fully grown, it usually leaves the milkweed plant. Sometimes it stays on the milkweed plant, um, but it finds a safe place to pupate. Monarch pupa are really well camouflaged. Whoops, sorry guys, went one too many. Aim this way. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, boy, it went way ahead. Okay, uh, monarch pupa are well camouflaged. They um, they have no other means of defense against predators. And uh, they are, that green color, that beautiful jade color, it is precisely the color of most milkweed leaves. It's, it's pretty astounding. And it's a really difficult stage of the monarchs to find. So when you go out looking for monarch life stages, um, you'll have, oh, I saw, you know, 10 individual monarchs you know, I saw, I don't know how many eggs, you know, I saw 15 eggs, I saw 30 larva, I didn't see any pupa. <laughs> They're very, very hard to find, and you have to look really carefully under leaves and um, even in vegetation away from milkweed, such as tall grasses and things like that, to find them. So um, what the caterpillar does is it lays down uh, through excretions out of its mouth um, this little uh, silky, um, just silk like mat, and then, then it attaches itself to that mat by, its, uh, it's called a, a cremaster, and that is a hook-like apparatus that's located on the tail end of the monarch larva. The caterpillar then allows itself to drop, and then it just kind of hangs there in the J shape. It's a thing, the J shape. <laughs> and uh, it'll hang there in that position for about one day. Then uh, the caterpillar skin will begin to split from the head end right here. And uh, that's when it, it is passing from that larval stage to the pupa stage of the uh, metamorphosis. And under the cow caterpillar skin now is this jade green casing 
which is called a chrysalis, and it's about an inch long. The green color is actually uh, the hemolymph of the animal. So, it, and the hemolymph is a fluid equivalent to blood in insects. So, uh, green blood, <laughs> and the chrysalis is actually, the, the shell of the chrysalis is clear, um, which is kind of deceiving. And then they have these, this beautiful marking on them that no, no one knows. It's just a mystery to everybody. No one knows why it's there. But I have to tell you, this is the most beautiful iridescent color. It's almost otherworldly, I have to say. And one time I was watching um, one kind of, you know, maturing and going from, uh, it'll actually be in the next slide, but as it's coming out of its, uh, the pubic case, and that color actually turned like an aqua before it turned clear. It was, it was like, I thought I was seeing things. I wish I had been filming it. Anyway, <laughs> so inside the chrysalis, um, in this stage right here, I mean, they're, they're literally, they turn into kind of monarch soup at that point. And this is the point where they're really reconstituting all of their body cells. Um, it, it's just a, kind of a remarkable thing. Um, evolution just blows my mind sometimes. But uh, the monarch's mouth parts are reformed so that the emerging butterfly will no longer have chewing mouth parts, but it will have a proboscis to sip nectar out of flowers. And the transformation also involves um, the formation of the wings, the forewings, hind wings, the reduction from four pairs of legs to three pairs of legs, greatly improved eyesight. Marks rely on their eyesight uh, tremendously, and formation of reproductive organs, which is their whole purpose for <laughs> going that direction. And uh, all of this happens in you know just about 11 to 18 days. Pretty remarkable. So uh, when they're ready to um, eclose, which is another word for you tonight, <laughs> which is them emerging from their pupa, it's called eclosure. Uh, the chrysalis it will suddenly crack open, and the monarch butterfly will emerge. Um, the wings are usually really tiny and shriveled and uh, crumpled and wet, and the butterfly then clings to its em empty chrysalis shell as the hemolymph, uh, which is uh, primarily in its, you can see how greatly, you know, enlarged its abdomen is right here. So what it's going to do is pump, you know, the fluids in the abdomen out into, um, you know, the, the circulation system in its wings. Whoops. Excuse me while I do a little um, maintenance here. <laughs> okay, hope oh, I'm good for recording. <laughs> so, um, and, and anyway, that hemolymph, it, it fills the body and the wings, and uh, those wings will enlarge and they stiffen. Uh, it takes about an hour after the closing, from its pupa before uh, the monarch's wings are kind of uh, dried and hardened off and it's ready for flying. And then you have your gorgeous adult. Um, the wingspan on the adult is about three and a half to four inches and we have some, some great specimens up here that you can take a look at. Uh, they have that beautiful uh, signature orange color with black veining and uh, two, you know, uh, two series of small white spots um, on the margin of their forewing and hindwing. Um, basically, you know, I, I kind of mentioned, you know, what um, kind of triggers them um, into that reproductive diapause. Well, first I should probably tell you um, the difference between, you know, the generations. Um, normally for the, you know, breeding season, you will have, those monarchs will live for maybe two to five weeks or so. Um, it's usually about a week before they become fully reproductive and then they're, they're mating, laying eggs like crazy. 
And then um, they die off pretty quick. And then um, that last you know, generation in the fall, uh, responding to decreasing daylight length, responding to fluctuating temperatures, cooler temperatures, and then really uh, poor host plant quality, meaning, you know, the um, ripening of grasses and uh, the drying out of vegetation, especially, um, you know, forbs and things like that. Uh, those all act together to induce that reproductive diapause, and then they uh, set out to their overwintering sites. So the annual migration of the monarch butterfly has been described as the most spectacular in the insect world. And it was classified by the International Union for Conservation of Nature as a threatened phenomenon as early uh, or as far back as 1984. Two populations migrate to the overwintering sites each fall. Monarchs generally um, east of the Rocky Mountains so this uh, whole large portion of you know the southern tier of Canada and all of the um, you know, Midwest and the East, uh, these butterflies migrate primarily to high elevation fir forests in central Mexico, whereas most monarchs that are west of the Rockies migrate to hundreds of small wooded groves along the California coast. Eastern migrant, or um, excuse me, eastern monarchs, they can migrate up to 3,000 miles. Western monarchs, up to 800 miles. These are distances that rival the epic migrations of songbirds or salmon. And it's really impressive to think of that for an insect weighing less than a gram. Now, some mixing between the eastern and western populations um, at you know, basically at the Rocky Mountains or at the Mexican overwintering site is thought to occur. And there's some, um, there's some evidence of that, but it's really poorly understood. And that's probably, you know, another avenue for, you know, great, <laughs> some great research, research to come out. Because what that would tell you is that, you know, if one or the other of the populations is in really dire straits, such as the Western, population right now, it's, uh, there's a potential to, to it, uh, for it to repopulate via the Mexican overwintering sites. These um, insects, especially insects in large numbers like this, tend to be really resilient in terms of their populations. They fluctuate a lot from year to year. So um, I'll talk a little bit about migration. I mean, I could do like a whole lecture series on migration of monarchs, and we're, we're not going to go there, obviously. But um, orientation in monarchs is, again, it's one of those things that's kind of poorly understood. But monarchs um, are thought to rely on a sun compass, which is basically the angle of the sun along the horizon, but it works in combination with an internal clock. So um, that helps the butterfly maintain its direction and its flight path. So if you, you know, have a butterfly that's going to take off at 10 o'clock in the morning, they know the sun angle at that time of day, they do a calibration and they head that direction. And most of these monarchs are heading in kind of a you know, southwesterly direction, both on both sides of the continent. Um, it's also been proposed that monarchs also use mountain ranges, you know, through visual uh, stimulation um, as landmarks to take a turn somewhere. So that um, is one explanation for why you have this western and eastern distinction. And it's one reason why, you know, if you think of the Sierra Nevada mountains through here, or I think that's the Sierra Madre mountains, um, you know, that's the mountain range is kind of funnels into that one spot there in the province of, or excuse me, the uh, state of Michoacan in Mexico. Very interesting. <clears throat> so I'll talk a little bit about breeding habitat for monarchs uh, collectively for North America. Um, obviously, milkweed is an essential feature of monarch habitat. 
and native milkweeds provide food for the monarch caterpillars, but they also provide really important nectar for the adults and many other pollinators as well. There are about 100 species of milkweed in North America and about you know, 44, I think, species that are in the western 11 states. Uh, nectar plants are a really key component of prime monarch habitat, um, and they're, again, very important for other pollinators like bumblebees as well. Uh, flowers, ideally, um, you want a diversity of native species with overlapping um, phenologies, and it, it, phenology is kind of one of those words I, I'm going to define for you. Uh, phenology is basically the study of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, um, especially as it relates to climate and plant and animal life. So, um, you know, you want these overlapping uh, kind of ripeness of <coughs> uh, wildflowers available so that there is a really continuous supply of nectar for monarchs through their breeding season. Um, other features such as uh, trees, shrubs, and other, you know, kind of vertical structure, plant structure for shade and perching or roosting may also be really key components of monarch habitat, but those are going to vary in importance throughout the monarch's life cycle, and those are really not well studied. So, boy, if anybody wanted to do and, you know, we'll talk about this an iNaturalist <laughs> type project to determine if monarchs in Idaho are using, um, you know, trees and shrubs for nighttime roosting structure or for migration roosting structure. That is uh, an area we know nothing about. We, we speculate, but we know nothing about it. <laughs> Excuse me again, I, I'm having uh, a... <laughs> Can't find the right spot to put this. There we go. My goodness. <laughs> this is where it's going to go. Okay, we're good. Okay, so I'm going to continue talking about uh, the different types of habitat out there for monarchs. Um, the eastern population, you know, I, I mentioned it overwinters um, in about the same 11 or 12. Um, these montane forest patches in, you know, the states of both Mexico and Michoacan in Mexico um, during the period October to March. Um, the monarchs just returned to Michoacan, you know, kind of over that day of the dead time frame. So they are, they are there right now. Um, they roost in these Oyamel fir forests at elevations um, anywhere from 7,800 to 12,000 foot elevation. Way up there, but consider, you know, how far south in latitude it is. And this picture shows, you know, how they kind of plumb on the landscape. Can you imagine how many monarchs are in there to actually, you know, reveal a shade of orange uh, from, you know, a, <laughs> Um, you know, kind of a drone shot like that. I, that's just astounding. Something I've got to see one of these days. And I mean, look at them just like dripping off the OML branches here. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Um, anyway, the forests do, they provide protection from wind and storms and exposure, um, provide exposure to dappled sunlight to keep the butterflies warm enough so they're not going to freeze. Um, they, they freeze that, you know, not good, <laughs> obviously, and uh, you want it cool enough so that they don't break that uh, winter diapause and start depleting their fat reserves that is, needs to take them back up into the, um, you know, the U.S. for breeding. Um, in the winter of 2018-2019, monarchs occupied a total of about 15 acres of OML forest. And based on how they, they count in Mexico, it's different how, than how we count in California, they basically figure out um, the number of monarchs in a square meter of tree here. <laughs> and they figured out there are about 5,000 monarchs in a square meter of tree. And then they, they calculate how much of these trees are covered by monarchs. 
And so through all those calculations, uh, six, 15 acres of monarchs is equivalent to about 121 million monarchs um, as of last winter. We'll see what they do this winter. Sorry, you guys. <laughs> wow, fussy, fussy. Okay, that's where we want. To. Okay, the overrunning habitat in western in the western population area, they're in uh, groves of trees that produce those necessary microclimate conditions for monarch survival. There are about uh, 400 known sites. California, on the California coast and even into very northern tip of Baja, uh, but only about maybe 75 of those sites are used in any one year. Um, the majority of the sites are located about a mile and a half or within a mile and a half of the Pacific Ocean or uh, the San Francisco Bay, where those water bodies really help to moderate temperature fluctuations. And suitable grow conditions include temperatures above freezing, uh, high humidity, dappled sunlight, access to water and nectar, and then protection from high winds and storms. <laughs> yeah, we might do that because this okay. is kind of consistently. Yeah, yeah I'm missing it. Point out, you know. Okay, all right, we'll do that. Um, so now I'm going to scope things down a little bit more uh, to the west and to Idaho, at two, and uh, kind of what we know or what we're learning about monarchs and milkweeds in the west, which, you know, I, kind of the monarchs we're going to see here around here. Um, so this picture, this is from the Xerces Society, just kind of a, ge a generic picture of the range of Western monarchs, uh, including about 11 Western states, and uh, the general patterns of migration from the breeding populations. So it covers um, quite a bit of an area. Go ahead. And this is, um, an image, this is modeled uh, potential monarch breeding habitat that was developed by uh, Tom Diltz and his team at University of Nevada, Reno. Um, so this, he uh, developed this model based on known records of monarchs, breeding monarchs, overwintering monarchs, all monarchs, and all milkweeds, several, you know, multiple species of milkweeds. And most of this data was crowdsourced data by citizen naturalists through uh, a website that I'll tell you about, the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. Um, there is really um, high accuracy in this map. And what it's showing you is that the darker the blue area, the more suitable that area is as breeding habitat for monarchs. Um, I'm really happy to see Idaho and Washington well represented in this model. Um, up until a few years ago, we had no data <laughs> to give them. So through, through this website and through surveys that uh, I and a ton of my colleagues and a lot of citizen naturalists did, we were able to populate um, a lot of data and um, learn more about where monarchs, breeding monarchs, and milkweeds occur in our state. So what we, um, what you generally see here, just for general patterns, um, you know, for, for Idaho, for instance, the Snake River Plain is a really important monarch breeding habitat, uh, particularly, you know, this, this central area and over here, and, you know, those correspond with a couple of our wildlife management areas in the state. Um, and then up here, this central, um, you know, valley region of, of um, Washington. Um, most of that, I guess, we would consider as the Columbia Plateau in there. Uh, this is a little bit lower elevation. And um, in Idaho, the limiting factor for milkweed and monarchs is elevation. 
We did not find any milkweed or any breeding monarchs above about 5,500 foot elevation. So that leaves that whole you know chunk of central Idaho in the Rocky Mountains not suitable for monarch habitat. It might be flyover, you know, but there's no breeding going on there, and there's no milkweeds. Uh, milkweeds just um, the species that grow in our state are just not going to be there. And then um, in this area where it is just you know no monarch breeding, well. You'll see from a, a milkweed map that I have that um, milkweeds do not grow um, up in that little corner, that western Washington area and portions of western um, Oregon because it's too wet. It's way too wet. And uh, milkweeds don't like to be wet, wet, wet. <laughs> um, and you see that too, like the elevational aspect up in the Okanagans up there, and then, you know, like the Wallawas and, you know, certain areas like that. But you, you will see how important California is to that western population and Arizona. And Arizona is, is really interesting because it's kind of a main line, you know, just like heading due south to the Mexican overwintering areas. So um, this area in particular is just really interesting from a monarch movement standpoint. Anyway, um, this is another really important area in the Salt Lake um, Basin area. Uh, just west of the Wasatch Mountains. And uh, being in Pocatello here, um, some of this area is, you know, really important. That Curlew National Grasslands area, it, it cranks out some monarchs and for a long period of time as well. And my, you know, my question in this area, like do these monarchs produce are they going to move over and overwinter in the California area, or are they going to come down here? And I, I will share with you some some information on that. We have a little bit of data uh, on movement from like the Boise area over to this area. So from there, do they just follow this you know line down here? Maybe following this drainage? because they, they do tend to migrate on river corridors. Um, and do they potentially go to the Mexican overwinter site? We don't know, but it's um, another important nexus with citizen naturalists, so, <laughs> yes. Do prevailing winds have an impact on their migration now? They don't seem to, which is surprising for something, you know, like I said, it's less than a gram in weight. Um, they, they don't because most of the prevailing winds are going to be more, you know, north, from the northwest in there. So they're kind of going across crosswise, but they um, they tend to travel low to the ground. Um, I think if they were, you know, like some bird species that really, you know, count on those prevailing winds, you know, to their advantage in migration, monarchs are, are just, you know, on the deck as they are moving through the landscape. So I think they're less affected by prevailing winds. Okay. Yes. Okay. So for um, let's talk a little bit about our western milkweeds. Um, Forty-four species that are native to Western North America. Um, there are twenty of these species that are known to be larval hosts for monarchs. They breed on at least twenty of these species. Some we just don't know. We haven't. We don't have the data yet. <laughs> um, so milkweeds occur in all western states, all eleven western states, and generally milkweed diversity tends to decrease as latitude increases. So you will have, say, the highest diversity of milkweed species in Arizona. I think they have something like thirty-two milkweed species in Arizona. And as you get, you know, kind of head your way north, um, Idaho, we have five native species. Washington has three. They have the least number of milkweed species. So, um, yeah, that, that species diversity decreases quite a bit. So if you, you know, if you, like in Arizona, I showed you that map, it showed a lot of um, monarch breeding suitability. So um, they have 
Farms have a lot of choice, um, diversity of milkweed species to, to breed on. Um, one thing as well, I mentioned the elevation. Um, you know, milkweed species, they're, they're generally absent along portions of the Pacific coast, as I mentioned, just due to high precip. Um, in some areas, like our, our Idaho Panhandle, they're, they're absent probably more because of forest cover and, you know, not a lot of open prairie type habitat like they tend to prefer. And um, they, there are no milkweeds known to grow above 9,000 feet, but that's in, you know, like the southern latitudes. <laughs> and like, as I mentioned, in Idaho, we don't have any milkweeds, you know, much above 5,000 feet. So we'll talk uh, just a you know real short overview of milkweed phenology. Um, remember, this is the study of the the seasons and uh, plant growth through the seasons. Um, so this is based on some work that I did in the salmon area. And what you have is uh, milkweeds emerging about in the in Idaho in the May time frame. Uh, that will vary a little bit, and the Snake River plant might be about two weeks earlier than where I am in, in salmon. And uh, go ahead. Then, um, you know, the, the plants emerging uh, from rhizomes, they, you know, many are um, grow from, you know, really dense rhizomes in the ground. And then you get into the bud stage. And then the full flowering stage, and uh, then you get into the first seed pod or pruning stage, and then finally into the seed dispersal. Um, so again, this is kind of in the for Idaho in the May time frame. This can be late May. This is June, July. Uh, we have the, this this particular species, which is called showy milkweed, is the most ubiquitous. Um, milkweed in the state by a mile, and it has a really long uh, bloom period, which is excellent for not only monarchs but for all sorts of other po pollinators. Um, then it will go into the seed, uh, this can be in like the late July time frame, or maybe mid July to late July and August, and then the, this. Um, you know, kind of the seed dispersal is usually in the September, October, November time frame. So um, kind of gives you an idea of the length of our, our season for milkweeds. Go ahead. In a milkweed identification, um, they vary widely in flower color, in growth form, in leaf structure, and in their phenology. But the flower and the fruit structure are similar among all species, and they're, I think, just very distinct. Um, so most of the milkweeds in the West are herbaceous perennials, meaning they die back in you know, fall, winter, and they sprout up again from those rhizomes or rootstocks in the spring. Um, this, um, the flowers, which I've got, you know, showing right here. Um, they have these five nectar storing structures called hoods and horns, which are right here and here. Those are very distinct. Um, you can kind of see them in this flower uh, of a, I think that is a, oh, what are you? I think you're a swamp milkweed. Um, and they have these subtended uh, five petals that uh, kind of curl back and they're, you know, generally recurved, um, bent backwards, which you can see right here. And the flower color can range anywhere from white to green to greenish yellow to pink to uh, kind of a deep purple, usually in those uh, shades, but it can be highly variable. They can be uh, extremely gorgeous. Some of them are just amazing, and some are extremely fragrant. I, I think they're just gorgeous flowers there, and they, they have a very complex flower structure, almost more orchid-like than you know other types of flowering plants. Um, the fruits are, um, 
these fleshy pods or follicles that they split at maturity to release these wind-borne seeds that are equipped with the fluffy white hairs. Um, those hairs are called floss or pappus, uh, coma or silk. And they catch the wind and they aid in dispersal. And um, I, the, that floss just drives me crazy because when I collect seed out there, it's so difficult to <laughs> get the seeds away from the floss. Um, I need like a chicken plucker or something. <laughs> you know, I need to come up with some better idea of, of kind of separating the, you know, the seeds from the, the floss. Um, so another similarity with milkweed plants is, is that they, they all secrete a white or clear latex when the plant tissue, tissue is damaged. You can see it from this little larva doing its little circular, semicircular grazing and uh, a leaf that's been knocked right here. So that's, uh, that's going to be present in, in all milkweed species. Go ahead. Another really key part of modern habitat is flower nectar. And um, unlike uh, monarch caterpillars that are you know, really highly host-specific, um, on milkweed plants. Uh, adult monarchs are very much generalist and they will feed on nectar from a wide variety of growing plants. Uh, though they do in um, probably most frequently do nectar on milkweed flowers because they're you know they're very uh, you know adapted to it and it's uh, a very good source and just a good source of energy for them. And they're usually in proximity to it because they're laying eggs on it <laughs> all summer. Uh, so flower nectar is very important for fueling all sorts of adult monarch activities, breeding, migration, overwintering. And the, the quality and the quantity of available nectar sources in the landscape is really thought to have a population level impact on monarchs. So there are like about 150 different nectar plant species that have been reported as being used by monarchs in the West. And milkweeds make up about um, a third of all those nectaring observations. And that was true in our, our Idaho study as well. Actually, it's a little bit higher than that. It's about 40%. So that does, it highlights the importance of milkweeds not only as caterpillar host plant, but as really valuable nectar sources for the adults. Okay. So talk a little bit about our um, Idaho monarch co uh, connection. <laughs> so Idaho is one of these 11 western states that contribute to the western monarch population. Um, the magnitude of that contribution was really relatively unknown until you know, fairly recently, we have a much better understanding of it. Um, so this um, this map right here shows kind of what we knew about milkweed and monarch distribution in, I think this was dated maybe 2013. And you'll see, like our, our entire database shows like one, two, three, four, you know, I think there, there are maybe four or seven monarch locations. In our, our, this is in our Idaho Fish and Wildlife Information System. And those are breeding season records, but it doesn't tell you if that's just a monarch butterfly flying over, if it's a, a larva, if it's a pupa, you know, you, we don't know. And, and then uh, we have milkweed records um, from our database as well. And we, we kind of partition these out by color. So the purple are milkweed records that are like pre-2000. So a lot of those were historic, you know, in the, even as late, late 1800s, early 1900s, all the way till uh, 2000, pre-2000. And then what we know more recently were the blue. There's still not, not a whole lot of records there, not enough to make any real assumptions, you know, about you know, status of monarchs in our state, and that kind of goes for these others as well. But um, some researchers did speculate that Idaho's contribution to the, you know, they, they kind of speculated about it, and they did some research and experimentation. 
Um, one such uh, research team was Stevens and Fry from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo area. They modeled the spatial extent of breeding monarchs in seven western states, including Idaho. Um, they used um, historical temperature data to identify portions of the west that had sufficiently long uh, warm thermal conditions and then late season milkweed uh, phenology that would support uh, kind of that late summer monarch recruitment, meaning it would it would support that last generation that would mi you know migrate to the Pacific coast. Um, so doing their modeling, they identified only one of ten climate divisions in Idaho that they thought would be suitable for monarch breeding, and that um, ended up being like in this Snake River Plain area right here, which is like about the lowest portion in our state, maybe outside of Lewiston. And um, everywhere else, they just thought it was um, going to be constrained by low uh, milkweed species diversity or semi-arid climates or uh, temperatures that just weren't sufficient enough for larval growth stages. So uh, there was another, um, there was a lepidopterist named Robert Michael Pyle, I think he's out of Washington State. Uh, he described modern butterfly currents in the Pacific Northwest as, uh, his quote is, patchier, rarer, and less consistent than in much of the U.S. and Canada. And I, I would kind of agree with that. <laughs> and he also speculated that, uh, quote, Idaho may achieve modest importance in good years in contributing monarchs to the population. Go ahead. Okay. And um, this is really interesting, too. Recent research that was investigating, like, the natal origins of Western monarch overwintering populations in California where did these monarchs in California come from? Um, they um, they suggested, you know, a somewhat larger contribution from what they call the Northern Inland Range, which was which included Idaho, Eastern Oregon, Eastern Washington, Montana, and Wyoming. Um, so, you know, kind of what I would call they call it Intermountain. I call it, you know, Intermountain West area. But uh, our our part of you know our our hood here, <laughs> and um, they used um, isotopic analysis of about 114 monarchs collected from four different sites in California, and approximately 40 percent of those individuals had developed in the northern inland range. And if, um, if you're familiar with uh, stable isotope analysis, which is you know, way beyond my comprehension <laughs> um, in the science realm, but it's based on the principle that you are what you eat. So stable, excuse me, stable isotope ratios, they vary among different food webs, and they're incorporated into an animal's tissue wherever they're ingesting that food. Um, so it is thus sometimes possible to infer the whereabouts of an animal moving between food webs. So they can detect, you know, certain isotopes in in monarchs that were eating milkweed in Idaho um, from, you know, the adults in in a different landscape. It's pretty <coughs> amazing research. It has incredible implications for all sorts of species. But that really did. Uh, kind of nail the fact that yes, we are contributors to that um, that overwintering population in California. Okay, go ahead. So um, in 2015, kind of in an effort to address some of these knowledge gaps that I, I kind of showed you, uh, lack of data about monarchs in Idaho, um, I uh, through my position in Idaho Fish and Game and um, a colleague with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife who put in a grant um, with the Xerces Society to fund some of this um, research and, you know, to try and, um, go ahead. You can just go ahead and go through all these here. <laughs> um, but what we wanted to do was just basically, um, you know, find out um, 
a lot more about monarchs in you know through multiple projects. So our grant supported um, like four collaborative projects over a two-year time frame. Uh, we did research and compilation to try and uh, gather all the monarch and milkweed occurrences we could find in herbariums and museum vouchers and other sources. Uh, we did um, <laughs> just a lot of surveys on the ground, and many of you <laughs> with Fish and Game uh, in the room here helped out with those surveys and um, contributed records to that, as well as um, many citizen scientists. Uh, we also um, developed and launched a website and this online data repository called the um, Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper to collect uh, monarch milkweed occurrences across all 11 states, not just our two states. And then we did a couple of uh, workshops in association with that um, to benefit land managers and citizen scientists. So I'm going to rip through this because uh, <laughs> we uh, we ended up with a lot of information. We uh, this is just for the Idaho results. We had almost 3,000 higher high accuracy milkweed occurrence records and of all five species of milkweeds, we found milkweeds um, distributed in all five ecoregions of the state and all 10 climate divisions. Remember I mentioned that that one researcher got, eh, you're only producing in one. We produce monarchs in all 10 of our climate divisions in the state. And uh, that includes 39 of 44, so about 80, I think 89% of all Idaho counties. We added about uh, a little over 600 new breeding season monarch records. They're distributed again across all five ecoregions, all 10 Idaho counties, or, or excuse me, all 10 climate divisions, and 73% uh, of Idaho counties. Um, I mentioned already, we, we found them below 5,500 feet. Um, we found the largest patches tended to be in that Columbia Plateau ecoregion, which includes the Snake River Plain. Um, and, you know, we were able to characterize the, the types of landscapes that they were most prevalent in, which tend to be um, you know, these moist, moist soil sites that would be valleys, floodplains, wetlands, riparian areas, and that um, certain key breeding habitats were wildlife areas. They were uh, national refuges. They were Curlew National Grassland. Um, and one of the reasons some of these were so valuable is because they had uh, two species of milkweeds present on them. And so it kind of extended the milkweed phenology for monarch breeding. So they could kind of jump between showy milkweed, the swamp milkweed, and uh, it just kind of perpetuated the generations. We also found that Idaho produces two and possibly three generations of monarchs. Go ahead. Um, I, yeah, I don't need to go through all this, but one thing I, um, I found very interesting is, you know, monarchs and milkweeds, there, there are very few of them in the sagebrush step areas of Idaho. Uh, they really need that moist soil habitat, and you just don't see that where we have, you know, kind of standard sagebrush step habitats. Um, and we were able to characterize some of the um, the nectar species in Idaho as well, um, which we had no data for, and we also um, identified you know, some of the major threats to milkweed and monarchs in the state, which, um, you know, just briefly tended to be herbicide use and mowing during the breeding season, primarily along roadsides. Uh, we also um, tagged um, close to 300 adult monarchs uh, through the Washington State University monarch tagging program. This was an effort just to see if we could get recaptures of adult monarchs during their migration to overwintering areas. And unfortunately, we didn't get any returns, which, you know, for 300, we probably should have gotten at least one or two, statistically. 
but we didn't. So that makes me scratch my head. Makes me wonder if they do go south, <laughs> you know, and because there's not a lot of people looking, you know, due south of us. A lot more people looking on the California coast. So um, anyway, one of the, the big suggestions, though, uh, for our future research to improve the knowledge of Western monarch cycle, breeding habitats, and threat factors in Idaho um, is here to continue to address data gaps in monarch and milkweed distributions in Idaho. We didn't get to all parts of the state, that's for sure. And um, anyway, that provides a good segue to um, opportunities for citizen scientists. So um, there are abundant opportunities here for you to contribute to Western monarch uh, conservation. And you can approach these opportunities as individuals, um, as, as groups, uh, you know, master naturalist groups, master garden groups. Um, you can do it passively, you can do it actively. The great thing is that, um, you know, all of the work that you do kind of helps to contribute to, to these growing data, this growing database of knowledge for the Western monarchs. So, go ahead. So I'm going to go through some of these opportunities here. Um, so one is, this is a relatively new thing, is to participate in the International Monarch Monitoring Blitz. And um, this really is only a few years old, but oh boy, we need some representation in the Pacific Northwest here. But this is kind of um, an unusual time frame. It's kind of like the peak of the breeding season just before monarchs are ready to head off uh, on their migration route. And it just gives us uh, biologists and um, conservationists a snapshot of where monarchs are at that point in time. And um, the 28 BioBlitz had, you know, they had a lot of great statistics. They got a lot of data out of that. So that's, that's one potential. Uh, the other is this Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper website that I told you about. Um, this was developed with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, Idaho Fish and Game, and Xerces. Xerces is the one that administers it right now. Uh, there's the, um, you, you can just kind of Google it up and it'll take it to you. You can sign up and uh, contribute records, photos, uh, <coughs> any data. You can uh, upload. Um, tabular data as well, but this um, has, I, I mainly, oh go ahead and uh, press again, please, oh. yeah, oops, that's okay, <laughs> yeah, so this has like probably the best resource for milkweed species in the West, uh, on the web, and there's beautiful pictures and uh, descriptions of the different milkweeds as well as distribution maps. So um, do check out this website and um, you know go ahead and, and sign in and consider contributing to this database. This is the largest monarch and milkweed database in the country right now. Go ahead. Um, this just kind of gives you an idea of that was that previous map, you know, like 2013 or whatever it was, and, and this is, um, you know, kind of a more recent representation of what we've populated in the past couple of years. So, um, anyway, and, and you can explore all sorts of data, excuse me, all sorts of data on this website as well. You can go ahead. Okay, iNaturalist. So this is um, an incredible um, website and uh, mobile phone application that I you know, highly recommend as well. Um, iNaturalist is um, it's kind of becoming the leading um, web, you know, kind of platform for contributing all sorts of different species information. And some of you, if you are master naturalists or involved in um, you know, different projects in this area are probably already using this, but um, it's a great um, sharing platform uh, for mapping and um, sharing data. It's um, It's got some features in it. Uh, first of all, it, um, it allows you to, you know, record uh, without cell phone or 
uh, cell phone reception or Wi-Fi, and you can upload your reports later. And um, it's just really great because you can use it on, you know, either you know Android or iPhone type apps. And it, um, you know, really the feature I like most about it is that like you can take a picture, say it's a milkweed, you don't know what species it is. You can then have the other viewers at the site, uh, participants, kind of crowdsource, you know, ideas on what that species is, so you can get it identified, which is I think just an incredible feature. So um, do consider, you know, iNaturalist as well. And we do, there is a new iNaturalist project that links directly now to the Western Monarch Milkweed Mapper. So, um, you know, that is just kind of a nice integration of those two websites. And again, it's this uh, data sharing that helps to, you know, just kind of keep improving what we know about these species. How many folks here know about Journey North? Journey North, the website. It's, um, it is another, just kind of an amazing uh, website. And uh, they have several projects listed under it, and you can sign up for any and all of them. But they, um, they track phenology uh, or migration and movements of different critters. Uh, they also do plants. They, um, they're one of the largest citizen science projects in North America. They have about 60,000 registered users. Um, they track migration of gray whales. They track hummingbird migration. They track leaf out, frog songs, swallow migration, and they track monarch um, you know, migration as well. And this is another great way to contribute. You can see it's heavy, heavy, heavy on the eastern, uh, you know, population side. So it would be great to get more data populated for the western um, monarch population. This is um, actually a Facebook site. Uh, there's no kind of companion website or anything, but this is a uh, Facebook site monarch, uh, Butterflies of the Pacific Northwest that is administered by a gentleman named Dr. J. David James. He is um, with the Department of Entomology, associate professor there uh, with Washington State University. And um, it's a great portal for looking up things on migration. Um, one of David James' specialties and his focus is on migration of the Western population. And he does a lot of monarch tagging and reporting. Um, the monarch tagging that we did in Idaho here, um, we did it through this Washington State University program. And I highly recommend it. Um, he, he does, uh, go ahead, you can turn to the next one. Um, you know, really, the um, monarch migratory pathways in Idaho are, are still really largely undefined, and we've only had really a few tag monarchs in the state, um, you know, show like a trajectory and you know, they're found in Oregon or California coastal, so they're heading for the Pacific Coast. Pardon? Oh, that's Dean. <laughs> yeah, it is Dean. <laughs> that's Dean. <laughs> um, but there, there is, you know, some really intriguing evidence. We, we've had a couple of tags uh, from that Boise area that I, I mentioned went over toward uh, Salt Lake City. Um, and then we kind of lost track, the, the monarch, you know, fell off the map. So why would a monarch move that far to the southeast unless it's maybe continuing in that uh, south or southeast trajectory? So there, there could be a direct, you know, connection between a particularly southeast Idaho and uh, directly to the Mexican overwintering sites. It would be uh, just a really interesting question to get answered. And uh, tagging is the only, tagging and that stable isotope research are really the only good tools we have right now to do that. 
and uh, tagging is something that citizen scientists are, are so helpful in doing. Um, so honestly, if there's ever an activity that to put a smile on your face, this is kind of it. <laughs> that that grumpy guy in the upper <laughs> right hand corner, that's one of my, my good friends, Hadley Roberts, uh, retired forest service up in Salmon. He never smiles. He never smiles. And there he is. He's just sitting in the ball. And um, I did. I just got a ton of help from um, all of my fish and game colleagues around the state. And I think, Maria, it's kind of fun, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> we tagged a lot of monarchs on Sterling. That's why he ends up there. Um, so, anyway, interested individuals, you can email Dr. James and request you know, a sheet of tags and with instructions and a data sheet, um, and he's glad to send that to you. Could you hit the, uh, there, his uh, email is up there if you want to take it down. Um, but I would highly recommend that first time taggers, um, <coughs> that, that you tie in with an experienced tagger, just to ensure that uh, protocols for safe netting and handling of adult monarchs are practiced. Uh, a lot of people, when they start netting monarchs, they they do a lot of injury to the wings, and if those wings are, are splint or anything like that, that monarch is not going to make it anywhere. So, um, anyway, it's something something to consider. It's a it's a blast, you guys. It's a blast, and it's important um, scientific data. Go ahead. Um, another fun thing, uh, there's this program, uh, it's with monarchwatch.org, um, they kind of issue these monarch way station, um, um, you know, what, what would I call it, just these placards and um, things like that. And, um, and so these are places that provide, you know, important resources for monarchs to produce successive generations and uh, sustain their migration. And you can help, you know, kind of putting these monarch way stations on the ground. Um, you can do it in a home garden. You can do it at a, you know, school, businesses, parks, zoos, nature centers, um, along roadsides, and on any other unused plot of land. They're not difficult to do. Require a little bit of funding, uh, but they these stations help to really offset. Um, the loss of monarchs and, and nectar plants in other areas. <laughs> and as of uh, September 2019, uh, there are close to 30,000 monarch way station habitats registered with Monarch Watch nationwide, and that includes several from Idaho. There's quite a few in the Boise area, Twin Falls, um, I think even the Ketchum area. Um, and it's a, a great project for uh, coordination and partnership uh, among master naturalists or master gardeners uh, in particular, um, and great to coordinate with you know your municipalities on these type of things. This is kind of a, a new project that I think it's really cool. I I'm I'm fine on this one for um, <laughs> my my new location. But uh, through the National Wildlife Federation's Mayor's Monarch Pledge, um, cities and municipalities, other communities, they're committing to create habitat for monarch butterflies and, and pollinators in general and educate citizens about how they can make a difference for these, um, these insects. Um, the picture in the lower left there is the mayor of Salem, uh, this gentleman named Chuck Bennett. And he was the first mayor in the state of Oregon uh, to take the mayor's monarch pledge to make the capital, that's the capital of uh, Oregon, and he did that to make their urban habitat a lot friendlier to pollinators. And um, something like this has benefits that kind of trickle down through, you know, the city structure. So, um, you know, the um, mayor's monarch pledge will impact what the road department does. You know, maybe they're not going to spray those roadsides anymore. Uh, less herbicides, less pesticides, and uh, practices, best management practices that could really uh, benefit monarchs and improve the environment. So I, I see this as, as kind of a, you know, insidious way of getting <laughs> to, um, you know, some of the, the 
getting away from some of the practices that are really uh, harmful to monarchs. Okay, next one. Um, this is this is not a precise project or anything, but this is kind of a you know maybe an idea. Um, the Idaho Transportation Department has really been active in improving management of their roadsides. They uh, right now they have a woman named Kathy Ford. Uh, she is kind of their roadside vegetation coordinator for the state and she's attended a couple of my monarch workshops in the past she's, she's come up and looked uh, at you know salmon monarch habitat and the roadsides up there and she's starting to implement workshops to all of their road maintenance crews um, and ITD manages a lot of roadside and a lot of that can be improved through you know seed mixes or not spraying, you know, milkweed and uh, wildflower patches, and um, generally improving these roadside habitats for pollinators and monarchs. So, um, just even talking to your local ITD representatives when you have a chance, or even just a letter to the local district saying, you know, well, hey, consider doing a pollinator demonstration project in this particular section of highway if you know there's milkweed maybe growing there already. Um, I, I think ITD is poised to really hear that and really respond. And uh, as far as I can tell, they're, they're going to be really good partners on this. So um, we've kind of got this really nice window of timing. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> Okay, and then individually, you know, people can plant native milkweeds and nectar plants on their own. Um, this is a beautiful pollinator garden um, in Portland, Oregon. It, they don't have much for monarchs there, but um, certainly for <laughs> um, wild bees and, and other, you know, butterflies and moths and things like that. This is uh, this is heaven, and. Um, in that vein of planting milkweeds, um, I brought along uh, packets of showy milkweed seed for you with some planting instructions. Um, I've got like 60 of them. If um, I think we, we've got enough to go around, I'm guessing, and if there's any left over, you're welcome to take those too. But um, just grab, grab one. We'll, we'll make one pass through and then we'll see what's left. But um, planting it yourself is really easy. And uh, once it grabs hold, which you know it might take uh, two, possibly three years before it starts flowering, but uh, then kind of look out. <laughs> and, um, monarchs are very, very capable of finding really isolated patches of milkweed. If you think, you know, you're, you're miles from the nearest milkweed yet, how will monarchs ever find this? You will be surprised. They have these scent receptors on their feet, and they just know where to go. It's kind of, that whole thing is kind of miraculous. And, that's a whole nother lecture. <laughs> Go ahead. So I'm going to touch uh, briefly on, I know I'm kind of going along right now, but I'll, I'll kind of wrap up here pretty quick. Um, I want to talk about this because um, it's something that I, I, you know, I have struggled with uh, professionally and struggled with some citizen scientists with as well. And um, it's, is a question that we need to ask. Are, are we helping or hurting monarchs by releasing, you know, say large numbers of captive reared individuals? And across the country, people are purchasing uh, monarchs for releases at wedding or celebrations, things like that. Um, and some are raising monarchs in classrooms and other educational settings, which um, actually, you know, in, in the small scale has benefits. But following news of this direct dramatic decline of monarch numbers, uh, some are rearing large numbers of monarchs in backyard operations, and um, or they're obtaining them from commercial growers or other organizations, and then releasing them with the goal of 
it like repopulating or, or supplementing local populations. So, you know, while raising and releasing small numbers, it offers important scientific and educational opportunities for, for teachers primarily, <coughs> um, and it helps to foster a connection with nature. Um, there is a growing concern about um, among scientists that releasing commercially produced and mass reared individuals is um, unlikely to benefit monarchs, but could actually hurt them. Um, <coughs> as a result of these mass rearing condi conditions that they promote crowding and disease spread. There are certain um, you know, parasites and viruses that are really prevalent in monarchs and to introduce those to wild populations would, would just you know, not be wise. But um, some of this also causes the loss of genetic diversity and it can disrupt uh, critical aspects of migratory behavior as well. There's a recent study that revealed that uh, monarch migratory behavior is remarkably sensitive to genetic and environmental change. And for these reasons, you know, monarch researchers recommend against these large scale captive rearings and release, um, releases into the wild. So, you know, instead of rearing, which is risky and it's unproven in helping monarchs, we should really be focusing more on effective ways to conserve this amazing butterfly, which you know are, are basically you know planting <laughs> planting monarchs, protecting you know them from pesticides and, and those type of things. Um, go ahead. So um, this I just wanted to mention: the Xerces Society website has amazing resources on monarchs, and one I just can't, these three I can't recommend high, highly enough. So these are monarch nectar guides, and they've got them regionally for the inland northwest and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, Pocatello area would probably be more for the Rocky Mountains, but I would, I would download both of these. You can download them or you could write to Xerces for a hard copy. And uh, they have uh, just long lists of uh, really good native wildflowers that provide really good uh, nectar resources for monarchs. And then the Managing for Monarchs in the West, that is a fairly new publication, and it, it kind of encapsulizes everything that we're talking about tonight. Uh, it, it's a, just a really beautiful publication that's available to download as well. Another great resource is Monarch Joint Venture. <laughs> Uh, they're, they're kind of the original monarch organization, and I, you know, Xerxes and Monarch Joint Venture, yes, <laughs> I worship them. <laughs> but they have uh, an amazing uh, resource section in here, everywhere from, uh, you know, learning about monarch disease and, and identification and monitoring. Um, so do check out that site. That is um, excellent, excellent information. Okay. And uh, this is a very new publication. Um, it was put together by Dr. Lynn Kincher, who is uh, the lead botanist for Idaho Department of Fish and Game. Um, it, it, it turned out beautifully. She's been working on this for a couple of years. And uh, the data she provided in here was uh, kind of fed by a lot of the citizen science work that went into the survey that I, I did with my colleagues. Um, so it, it's a great uh, resource for the five species of milkweeds that grow here in Idaho. Excellent. Uh, you can download it. Um, I guess at, I don't, how come I didn't put the <laughs> web address on there? If you just Google up, a guide to the native milkweeds of Idaho, it'll come right up. And it's available in the PDF for download. There are, um, I think Idaho Fish and Game has some hard copies. They're, they're booklets, pretty substantial. Um, you could probably order it through the headquarters office. Okay, um, so monarch butterflies, they are part of our natural heritage in Idaho. And there's much that we can do to keep monarchs flying in our state. We can protect natural habitats, 
We can plant milkweed and flowers. We can avoid pesticides. We can supply wildlife or support wildlife friendly local and organic agriculture. We can contribute to research efforts via community science. And we can organize ourselves to push for policy changes if you're one of those more politically inclined persons. <laughs> anyway, that's um, that's kind of what I wanted to present to you. Next slide is, um, I'll take any questions you have, and uh, please write down my email if you have any questions about milkweeds, monarchs, um, particularly for the western states, uh, please, please give me uh, send me an email. I'm glad to, glad to respond to you. So, yeah, uh, lights on. yeah, we'll get the lights on and wake everybody up. <laughs> Thanks. I, yeah, I think I want to thank you. Sure. You're on a journey coming to Idaho from Montana. So thank you for journey, journeying down and sharing your knowledge oh, and slides. And oh, yeah. fun. The butterflies and hopefully we've generated some community citizen engagement. So. Yes. I had a question about the pictures of the monarch that we went through. It looked like a lot of the monarch's coloring was faded, kind of a dark gray. Uh -huh. Does it change when they went to? Oh, I, I'm going to answer his question and then I'll get to you, okay? Um, so, yes, and you notice the two tone, right? So, the, um, the underside of both the forewing and the high, hind wing is uh, the scale color is dull on that side, and when they're, you know, just kind of you know, fully extended, and you're looking at the top or the dorsal side, that's where most of the pigmentation is. And um, so that's why it looks, they almost look brown. They look like leaves. They just look like, you know, kind of old leaves. So yeah, it's interesting that you notice that, because it is very noticeable when they cluster like that. Yeah. Yes? <laughs> Are they dormant at all when they're wintering? Yes, <coughs> they, they're, they're not really in uh, true hibernation, you know, as some mammals can be. Um, they're, they're in what I, I mentioned is a, a reproductive diapause, meaning they're, they're just kind of like on hold. They're, they're working on stored lipids, like stored fat reserves. And that, the fat reserve has to last them from basically November, December, January, February into March when they disperse from that site. And so they, they do uh, a moderate amount, like on warmer days, they will go and they'll, they'll kind of flutter about, they might water, they might, um, you know, find a nectar source somewhere. And uh, they'll do a little bit of feeding, but mostly they're they're just kind of in a holding pattern at that time, with doing very little activity. Sir, did you have a question? Okay. <laughs> well, I have a quick question on the tagging the, the, with those stickers. Uh -huh. So, do people just report when they find the monarch, or is it some sort of GPS? No, there's no. I wish there there was some <laughs> radio telemetry or you know satellite telemetry capability, but they just don't weigh enough. And um, so even you know those, those tags are pretty lightweight. Uh, they're about the size of maybe an M&M, you know, about that size. Um, and you have to put them just so on the wing so that you're you're not disrupting their uh, you know balance. Their, yeah their balance at all so um and, and people well you know this gentleman noticed that when they're perching you know they fold their wings up and that's the size that you put the tag on so when when the monarchs are perching um you know either roosting on their wearing areas or if they're in transit and they're nectaring, they will often just, you know, hold their wings up and those tags are really visible. Like if I was watching a monarch, you know, from here across the room, hey, Becky's got a monarch on her shoulder up there. <laughs> 
Um, and it folded swings out. From here, I could, this is Hawaii, I could see that white tag because it really uh, shows up quite a bit. And so then you have to approach and get a little bit closer. Binoculars are very helpful. You want to read the number on that tag mm -hmm. and then make sure, you know, the source. Uh, so, like WashingtonStateUniversity.org is on that, and you can report to that website. Or, um, but you want to try and get the code like A1074. It's usually, you know, like a four. Or Are there what? What, what do you say? Monarchs. Thank you. Predators. Predators. Oh, predators and monarchs? Yeah. Are there are, but let me make sure. Can I answer the question? Yeah. Okay. okay, that's okay. So, yes, there are predators and monarchs. There are actually quite a few. So, when they're in the egg stage and when they're in the caterpillar stage, they're pretty tasty morsels for a lot of things, and primarily for other insects. And uh, praying mantids are like wicked on all of them. And praying mantids are, are wicked on adults. <laughs> I've got a couple pictures of praying mantids with wing parts <laughs> you know, in their clutches. So, um, and then they're um, often parasitized by wasps or uh, one critter in particular, particular called the tachinid fly. And what they do is they lay eggs in the soft body of the caterpillar, and that caterpillar will die. I mean, it just, and then, you know, the eggs uh, eventually just kind of fall out onto the ground. Um, so they, yeah, they, they are really susceptible. Um, birds, not so much, um, because they, birds have a, can have a sense of taste, or smell even sometimes, and um, they they are repelled by the um, parthenolide chemical that's kind of sequestered in their tissues. I have seen praying mantis. You do have praying mantis. Well, yeah. I've seen a couple. Uh huh. Yeah. And spiders are are really um, very um, voracious predators of eggs and smaller larvae. They're pretty wicked on them. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I've read that there's a bug, a milkweed bug, that um, is on some of the milkweed. Yes. Can you talk about that? Or? Sure. I, I wish I had a picture to show you uh, handy, but there, uh, it, it is called a, a longhorn milkweed beetle, and it's very common. It's very common. We saw it throughout Idaho. We saw it up in Lewiston area, up way up in the Panhandle, all the way across St. Bernard Plain and Salmon, all over. And it, um, it's it's really harmless to monarchs. It, it's you know maybe a little bit of a competitor for because it does eat milkweed, um, but I haven't really you know it's nothing like I would call a competition. You know, for for the uh, you know grazing rights <laughs> to a milkweed, but they um, yeah they kind of appear through the year and they can get pretty large and they have very long segment and ten uh, antennae. They're bright orange, similarly to the monarch orange, which suggests to me that they also sequester those uh, milkweed pardenide toxins. Do you know what fox elder bugs are? Yes. Are they anything like that? Uh, they so they're, they're they're different. They're in uh, I think a different family. They're uh, the uh, milky longhorn beetle. It's a coleoptera in the coleoptera family. Uh, whereas the there there are some other milky bugs that are true bugs, uh, Hemiptera family. I'm pretty sure, and they're they don't get quite as big as those longhorn beetles do. But there's, a, I mean, there's a variety of insects that that, that hang out in milkweed, and, but not too many that actually eat the foliage. I have seen grasshoppers um, eat the foliage. You know, um, you know, you expect that they eat anything, pretty much. Yeah. Yes, sir. So monarch butterfly populations are declining. How about other butterflies? Well, it, it's it's variable. <laughs> you know, um, in general. 
I, I probably can't even make a, a general statement in, in a butterfly is a general one I'm defining all around. I, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, there are several endangered and threatened butterflies, and like probably a hundred that are on the waiting list for review as threatened or endangered. So, um, you know, in general, they're, they're just, in, in one respect, they're, they're incredibly resilient animals when you think of monarch migration, um, you know, their life cycle, how, how that all works. But they're also fragile in that they, you know, they're very susceptible to pesticides. And we use, you know, in this country, we use a lot of pesticides, and a lot of them are very lethal to Lepidoptera, you know, that family. So um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, in general, many are in the farm. Um, but a lot of them are not migratory, like the monarch, because that adds, you know, kind of more <laughs> cuts and injury <laughs> along the way. And, um, you know, that, you know, that chain of migration, uh, there, there's multiple ways that can be interrupted and disconnected. And so that, that's like the real concern with monarchs. Other right. questions? Okay. We'll do it.